Let me take a moment to welcome and introduce Arkansas's First Lady, Ginger Beebe. Ms. Beebe, would you please stand? What you need to know is that this morning, the First Lady and our guest speaker, in partnership with City Year, read with students at 7th Street Elementary School in North Little Rock. Participate in social change. And I'm sure all of us are delighted that a most distinguished representative is here to address this issue tonight. John Lithgow is an enormous, enormously successful giant. He's also very tall. <laughs> He's a giant on the stage, in cinema, on TV, in music stores, on the ballet floor, and now on the internet. His passionate education and nurturing of children over the last decade have been a sterling example of how the artist can serve the public, in this case, in the promotion of literacy and higher education. Mr. Lithgow was literally born into the theater. His mother was a retired actress, and his father, Arthur, ran the McCarter Theater in Princeton as its producer and director. He was involved in high school productions, where he was described by a friend of mine as incredibly intense in the lead role in Sartre's No Exit, just as a sophomore. The acting family. <laughs> Thank you so much. Well, that was unquestionably the best and most thorough introduction I've ever been given. No one, no one has ever mentioned the miracle of birth. <laughs> I am so delighted to be here today. I, I've had a wonderful day in Little Rock, my first day ever in the state of Arkansas. Uh, I even got to entertain little children with the First Lady this morning. It's been a wonderful time, and uh, I'm very, very honored to be here to, to uh, address all of you. Uh, I, I've written a speech, which I hope won't be too long and uh, portentous. Uh, but let me tell you that I didn't know much, I didn't know anything about the Clinton School before coming here today. I didn't do my research. But I found to my delight and to my enormous relief that the speech I've written fits right into the mission <laughs> of the Clinton School, a place that it really stirs my heart. Uh, I, I think it's unique. Little Rock, all of you associated with it, should be so proud. Uh, to me, you all, you're already sprouting ring, wings because you're on the side of the angels. It makes me all the more delighted to be your speaker tonight. So here's my speech. I noticed there are some little children here tonight. I'm going to bore you to tears, kids. <laughs> But just be very patient, because uh, you'll get your due by the end of my speech. All right? I've called my speech Four Lessons, and you can ignore that title if you like. In choosing me as your speaker this evening, you good people from the Clinton School, you have shown uncharacteristic recklessness. <laughs> you see, we actors make our reputations and build our careers by speaking other people's words, ask us to express our own thoughts, and you never know what's going to come out. I barely know myself. My reflexive instinct, of course, is simply to entertain you, and in fact, I do intend to offer up a modest performance by the end of my remarks, but I am well aware that this is a dignified occasion and a certain degree of gravity and wisdom is called for. But wisdom from an actor? Are you kidding? <laughs> if I were a wise man, I never would have gone into the acting profession. Rather than presuming to pass down wisdom, I have decided to think of my speech tonight as simply a, a friendly and anecdotal conversation with all of you about my curious, picaresque life and career, and I leave it to you to root out any scraps of wisdom therein. I bet that word picaresque got your attention. 
I'm afraid that that is one of the few words that I remember from my four years of college 40 years ago. As I recall, the word picaresque is used to describe a long adventure which teaches its hero a series of lessons to live by, an apt subject for this very speech. Although I hesitate to dub myself a hero, my adventures, such as they are, have indeed taught me a few stray lessons in life, and what better time than now to share them with you. I'll get to the adventures in a moment, but let me lead off with the lessons. Basically, they boil down to four succinct phrases. Be creative, be useful, be practical, be generous. Simple as that. And now for the adventures. <laughs> Many of them you already know, such as the nature of the entertainment business that whenever an actor does something notable, whether that something happens to be very good or very bad, everyone knows about it. But tonight I'm going to tell you about some less public adventures of mine, which you probably haven't heard about in, spe in spite of my long introduction, but which have been extremely important to me in my life. The first one involves my alma mater. Forty years ago, I graduated from Harvard College. A curious start to an acting career, to be sure. Back in those days, Harvard was a pretty unlikely launching pad for an actor. Natalie Portman and Matt Damon had not come along yet. But what could I do? I, I couldn't imagine doing anything else with my life. So as soon as I graduated, I hurled myself into the acting game, where for the next 20 years, I kept my Harvard degree a closely guarded secret. <laughs> Somehow it never seemed to come in all that handy when I was auditioning for a soap opera or a laxative commercial. <laughs> But in my mid-40s, having finally created a viable acting career for myself, I discovered that, in fact, Harvard had a lot more to teach me. My second Harvard education began when I was invited back into the fold in 1989. That was when I was asked to run for the Harvard Board of Overseers a 30-member university governing board packed with senators, CEOs, and college presidents. The invitation astonished me. Why me, I asked. Presumably, presumably it was to redress the fact that no one from the world of the creative arts had served on the board since the poet Robert Frost back in the 1930s. <laughs> in another moment of recklessness, the Harvard alumni elected me. Well, I spent the first half of my six years as a Harvard overseer wondering what the hell I was even doing there. This shabby, disreputable, and at that particular moment, unemployed Hollywood actor among all those Brahmin high hats. But then I recalled my personal agenda. I was presumed to be the arts overseer, so I proposed an overseer's ad hoc committee on the arts. The committee was quickly voted into existence, mainly because there seemed to be no good reason for anyone to vote against it. Then in 1993, this new committee created something called Arts First, a springtime celebration of undergraduate arts activity at Harvard. Arts First was to become my pride and joy. The Harvard Board of Overseers, you see, had given me a unique, almost unheard of opportunity. At one of the world's most venerable, tradition-bound educational institutions, I was suddenly permitted, even encouraged, to invent a whole array of brand new traditions. I could make them up out of whole cloth, get a bright idea, and presto, it was a reality. That four-day festival in 1993, with its parade, its barbecue, its big yellow tent,
and its dozens of campus-wide performance venues has been replicated 15 times ever since. A mini Edinburgh festival on the Charles River, growing bigger and bigger every year. By now, thousands of students prepare all year to perform at Arts First, and thousands of people from inside and outside of the Harvard community pour onto the campus that weekend to attend art, dance, music, theater, and film events all within the sequestered halls of Harvard Yard, flung open to the public for the occasion, and all of it free of charge. That's arts first, and it's now virtually impossible to imagine a school year at Harvard College without it. And I thought of it all by myself. <laughs> The, re the creation of Arts First was a lesson for me in the power of a simple idea. But the big lessons were yet to come. In 1995, my last year as an overseer, I had another bright idea. This was the Harvard Arts Medal to be awarded every year during Arts First to a Harvard alum who had gone into the creative arts. The idea was to highlight the fact that although the instances are rare, Harvard students do sometimes become artists and major artists at that. Again, the board agreed to the proposal and that spring, the first Harvard Arts Medal was presented to the late Jack Lemmon, a delightful, funny, open-hearted and grateful honoree. Since then, the award has been presented annually, 13 times in all, to such splendid artists as novelist John Updike, filmmaker Mira Nair, composer John Adams, and cellist Yo-Yo Ma. In all these years, I haven't missed it once. Every spring, one of the events planned around the presentation of the Arts Medal has been a question and answer session that I have conducted with the honoree for an audience of interested students. My yearly conversations with the medal-winning artists have made up the core curriculum of my second Harvard education. For although none of these honorees was an educator, all of them were dazzling, inspiring teachers. My moments with them, with all those students following every word, have been the best adventures of all. Several of these medal recipients had something in common. They told about pet projects they had initiated that went outside and beyond what they were known for. Having achieved success in their fields, they had looked around, spotted problems or challenges, and figured out how they could help. Then they had boldly used their success to make good things happen. They tended to tell their stories without self-aggrandizement, only after being prodded, and they tended to tell them in a sensible, business-like manner, as if they were describing good carpentry or a well-run board meeting. I began to see that many of the qualities that made them great artists were the same qualities that made them good people. It was through their words that I began formulating my simple lessons to live by. These people were all creative, God knows, but their actions were also eminently useful, practical, and generous. Let me give you some examples. The 1996 medal recipient was the great folk singer Pete Seeger. Yes, he went to Harvard. He thrilled the students with his story of the Sloop Clearwater. Anybody know the story of the Sloop Clearwater? It's a good one. One day in the mid-60s, on a train ride to New York City from his upstate home, Pete Seeger sat next to an acquaintance from the world of business and finance. Looking out the window at the Hudson River, Seeger daydreamed aloud about building a replica of one of the great sailing vessels that had carried goods along that route to and from the Erie Canal 150 years earlier. 
Six months after that chance meeting, Seeger was astonished when the same acquaintance approached him on the same train and told him he had raised the money for Pete's fanciful pipe dream. <laughs> He'd been looking everywhere for him. Pete's response, he recalled, was, well, I guess now we're going to have to build it. <laughs> Within a few years, Seeger was sailing the Hudson on the sloop Clearwater, giving concerts at cities and towns along the banks, taking children on historical field trips, and raising people's consciousness about the sad state of the polluted Hudson. Using the ship as a potent symbol, he lobbied the federal government on behalf of the Clean Water Act. The act was passed in 1972 and remains one of the most successful environmental laws in history. As for the Hudson River, its level of pollution is drastically lower than it was that first day on the train a change which came about substantially because of Pete Seeger's whim. And Pete Seeger, you recall, is a folk singer. The following year, the medal winner was Bonnie Raitt. She had a good story, too. At the height of her success, having sold millions of records and having won a slew of Grammy Awards, she was approached by Fender Guitars with a very lucrative offer. They wanted to produce and sell a new model autographed guitar, one suited to her particular style of blues playing. She answered that she had no interest in making money off of her autograph on a guitar, but that she would accept their offer on one condition. She would use her share of the proceeds from the sale of this new guitar as seed money to fund guitar lessons for inner city kids all over the country through the Boys and Girls Clubs of America. Fender, she insisted, would have to lend its support as well. The program was adopted and quickly spread to over 200 venues. 14 years have passed since Bonnie's bright idea. Now known as the Boys and Girls Club Program for Music Education, it's still going strong. Now, my entire speech could be devoted to stories like this. David Hayes in the National Theater of the Deaf, Mira Nair and her film school in Uganda, Yo-Yo Ma and his Silk Road project. These were all marvelous, inspiring tales, but was, what was especially exciting about them was the fact that they were being told to college students just at the moment when they most needed to hear them. Because here's the point. Most young people reach college age with lofty, ambitious goals. They need these goals. They need their idealism and their optimism. They need words of encouragement, support, and hope. But there's something else they need to be told. And those of you who to here tonight who have reached that age, let me tell it to you loud and clear. When you get what you're aiming for, and many of you will, think about what else you can do. Think about the people I just described to you, how they went beyond their original aspirations, sometimes in wildly unlikely ways. Think about how they made a difference in the world, and how much joy and proud, pride they took in what they accomplished. Think about how they mingled art and commerce for the public good. And then, if you like, take the word art out of the equation, because you certainly don't have to be an artist to follow their example. It's sometimes a very simple thing to be creative, to be useful, to be practical, and to be generous. I followed their example myself. I conducted six of those yearly arts medal interviews during my six seasons on the TV sitcom Third Rock from the Sun. That show was arguably the most successful job I ever had. Certainly got the most applause tonight. <laughs> Popular, high profile, lucrative, deliriously fun. But its very success gave me the opportunity to branch out from it. In retrospect, I've come to believe that consciously or unconsciously, 
Those annual visits to my old college inspired me to create an entire concurrent second career. Let me explain. Ever since my own kids were tiny, I always entertained children. I sang songs, played guitar, and told stories to them in classrooms, assemblies, and benefits. I got very good at performing for that extremely difficult, distractible audience, and I just loved it. Back from Harvard, sprawled in my dressing room near the Third Rock soundstage, I began thinking of what good use I might make of that particular enthusiasm. A hit sitcom is like a magic wand. When you suggest things to people, they tend to say yes. <laughs> so I began making suggestions. First, there was an album of kids' songs for Sony Records. That led to children's concerts at Carnegie Hall and with major symphony orchestras in Baltimore, Pittsburgh, Detroit, and Chicago. I started writing songs and stories for the concerts. One of the stories became a children's book, then a second, third, fourth. I started being referred to as actor and best-selling author. <laughs> I wrote the narration for a new version of Carnival of the Animals for the New York City Ballet. As you heard, I even danced the role of the elephant, something I'm not going to do tonight. <laughs> All of these projects had the simple, obvious goal of delighting children, but I had a secret agenda, too. I was seeking to stir an interest in the arts in young people, to educate them without their knowing it. I hold the fierce conviction that the arts are indispensable to a healthy society. But everywhere, I see evidence that support for the arts is foundering, even under assault. I realized there was something I could do about it. With Jesuitical zeal, I began to see a personal mission taking shape. I could get them while they're young. As the scope of my kids' activities broadened, I emerged as a kind of pied piper of arts, education, and literacy for kids. And it turns out, it's one of the best roles I've ever had. Through all of this, Pete Seeger, Bonnie Raitt, and all the others were never far from my thoughts. Then came that voice on the telephone a couple of months ago, asking me to be your speaker tonight. Flattered by the invitation, but daunted by the task, I went back to basics. I reminded myself of my four lessons. I asked myself, what have I done lately that's creative, useful, practical, and generous? And the actor in me asked one other question, what can I do for a big finish? <laughs> As promised, children, it's time for my performance. What is it, you ask? Well, number one, it is creative. I created it myself. It's a book. It's the most recent of my seven children's books out this past year. It's called Mahalia Mouse Goes to College. And just to bring things full circle, you can call it a picaresque tale. <laughs> it's about a mouse named Mahalia who has lots of adventures and learns a lot of things along the way. I'm going to close my speech by performing it for you. And uh, for those of you who, my apologies to those of you who were at the 7th Street Elementary School this morning, you'll be hearing it a second time, I'm afraid. Is it useful? Well, it's certainly intended to be. It's a story that's calculated to make little children curious and excited about learning, about education in general, and about college in particular, even at a very young age. Is it practical? Well, I think so. It's my pragmatic contribution to a debate that's raged among e educators for years. How do we, as a society, lure young girls into the traditionally male-dominated fields of math and science? What's my angle? Well, as you will shortly learn, my heroine, Mahalia Mouse, happens to be a scientific genius. And generous? Well, I hope so. 
I've come to see performing in its purest form as an actor's gift to an audience. So perhaps you will think of my recitation as my parting gift to you. Now here it is. Sit back, pretend you're six years old again. Some of you won't have to pretend. <laughs> Savor the sublime absurdity of the moment and listen to Mahalia Mouse goes to college. The skies of September were bursting with rain, pelting the old dormitory. You, out. <laughs> you know what, I'm going to start again. <laughs> but when I, as I start again, why don't all of you little children come down front so you can really hear this, okay? Come, there's a nice space for you right down here. Go right, right down here. Right down in front of me. Don't be shy. There's a whole lot of you. You had to sit through that long speech. There's no reason why you shouldn't have your moment. Okay? Oh, good. There's a lot more than I thought. <laughs> Man, if I'd known you were all here, I'd have I would have torn up my speech. <laughs> Is this everybody? Come on, come on. All of you grown-ups who feel like six-year-olds, you can come down too. <laughs> Moms, dads, you can come if it's necessary. Okay, we've got, got somebody else. Come on, we've got a space for you right down here. Come on, come on. Okay, actually this gives me a chance to have a little drink of water. I'd like to thank the woman with the walkie-talkie, by the way. <laughs> I thank you and the children thank you. Okay, we'll start again, shall we? The skies of September were bursting with rain, pelting the old dormitory. It filled every gutter and choked every drain. <laughs> Chapter one. <laughs> of Mahalia's story. <laughs> A family of mice huddled up to keep warm. Their basement was flooded with water. The mother peered out at the furious storm, then turned and addressed her young daughter. Mahalia, darling, she said with a sigh, your father's not back till tomorrow. So wrap up in newspaper, keep yourself dry, and find us some cheese or a scrap of meat pie. The children are starving, the babies may die. Then she faltered, consumed by her sorrow. Mahalia hugged her, then scampered outside, sheltered by clumps of wisteria. In minutes, she'd found a secure place to hide, in a hall by the dorm cafeteria. Nearby lay a backpack, unclaimed, on the floor, smelling of cheese and roast beef. Mahalia climbed up inside to explore like a seasoned, self-confident thief. She found a fat sandwich and plucked out the cheese, stuffing it into her sack. When suddenly, zip! A sharp sound made her freeze as everything faded to black. Imprisoned in darkness, she tumbled and tossed, but what could Mahalia do? Tormented by fears of a grim holocaust, she pictured her home and her family lost. A sack full of cheese had been bought at such cost. Mahalia's Tale, Chapter 2. The backpack went boop as it came to a rest, then zip opened up to the light. Peeping outside it, the mouse was distressed by a strange, unfamiliar sight, a room unlike any she'd been in before, full of rows upon rows of young students. 
Mahalia beat a retreat to the door, repenting her recent imprudence. But a voice held Mahalia fast in her place. This course is extremely advanced. It concerns the behavior of atoms in space, their collisions and fissions, their motion and pace. Don't take it unless you're an absolute ace. Mahalia Mouse was entranced. In her lonely new lodgings, she took the course on, overwhelmed by its daunting regime. But one night as she slept, in the hour before dawn, her mother appeared in a dream. My baby, she said in a quavering voice, you're off to a wonderful start. Don't think about us. Just believe in your choice, be happy, and follow your heart. Thereafter, whenever she sneaked into class, the mouse would recall every word. But one day, in the midst of a lecture, alas, the unthinkable finally occurred. <gasps> An ear-splitting shriek pierced the air, and instantly chaos took hold. Where? People screamed. Over there! Over there! Some ran for an exit. Some leaped on a chair. Mahalia, trembling with fright and despair, felt the blood in her body run cold. The professor stepped forward to calm the class down. He stood at Mahalia's side. He stared at her notes with a serious frown. This mouse is a genius, he cried. Her grasp of the subject is sharp as a blade. This rodent will study with me. <laughs> By noon, he had kept the bold promise he'd made. Her books were all purchased. Her lab fees were paid. <laughs> her doubts and her fears were completely allayed. Mahalia Mouse, chapter three. That day marked the start of four glorious years. Mahalia Mouse went to college. Admired and respected by all of her peers, she gathered a broad range of knowledge. Along with her major, she dabbled in art, in history, math, and zoology. But one course especially captured her heart, the basics of human psychology. <laughs> Activities, too filled Mahalia's days, for no shrinking violet she, fencing and football, recitals and plays, glee club and squash, a brief square dancing phase. <laughs> At the end of four years of achievement and praise, it was time to receive her degree. As she giddily braced for her June graduation, a hundred reporters all sought her. And that's how her parents, in wild jubilation, stumbled on news of their daughter. At commencement, Mahalia marched with her class, perched on a friend's brawny shoulder. Thousands of well-wishers saw the mouse pass, craning their necks to behold her. All at once, she went pale. Her palms were like ice. Her face wore a stricken expression. Her eyes were transfixed by a family of mice crouched alongside the procession. <gasps> my mother! My father! Mahalia cried as she skittered on down to the ground. When she landed, her family rushed to her side, exploding with love, with relief, and with pride, a jumble of feelings too joyous to hide, for the child they had lost had been found. And so we take leave of Mahalia's tale, a story of stout self-reliance, an epic account on a miniature scale of a mouse who set forth on life's bumpy trail and succeeded by simply refusing to fail Mahalia, Bachelor of Science.
<laughs> and that's my speech. <laughs> oh, please. <laughs> Let's go ahead and clap again. That thing was that was absolutely wonderful. And for those of you in the back that could not see the children looking up at this, there's a little boy right here on the front row. The first lady and I, our eyes were on the hook. He's going to have a crick in his neck. He was absolutely. <laughs> John, thank you very much. Now, we're going to take a few questions. So we have some microphones in the audience. So if you would uh, if you'd raise your hand, if you have any questions at all, um, please, uh, please do so. And we'll take a few before we, before we leave and do the book signing. We have one back here. Mr. Lithgow. Yes. Have you ever thought about playing FDR? Ah, I played FDR. Oh, well, when? Yes. I, I was on a, a mini series, a two part mini series on NBC in the early 90s called uh, World War II When Lions Roared, which was about. Uh, FDR, Churchill, and Stalin, and all their diplomatic dealings during World War II. I was FDR, Winston Churchill was played by Bob Hoskins, and Stalin was played by Michael Caine. <laughs> so, <laughs> not many people saw it, and not many people remember it, but, but yes, I, I'm flattered that you would ask. I saw his bust today in the Oval Office. Other questions? Right behind, right behind you, right there. Go ahead. We're big fans and Thank would you. like to know um, what's next for Marsupial Sue. Oh, how nice of you to ask. I've already written one sequel to Marsupial Sue. Maybe you, you know about that. Marsupial Sue is the kangaroo who hates to hop. Uh, I sang that this very morning to the children at the Seventh Avenue School and. I also did, performed the sequel, Mahalia Mouse, uh, I mean, Marsupial Sue Presents the Runaway Pancake. Um, I think she has retired. I, I don't know whether she will be uh, pulled out of retirement. Depends on whether I can think of anything else for a kangaroo to do. Yes, do you have a question? We have one right back here. Yes, sir. Go ahead, John. Uh, when I saw you in uh, Dirty Rotten Scoundrels, I tried to ask you about your painting. Ah. Uh, you were too shy to talk about it, but have you thought about illustrating your own children's books? Uh, you know, my editor has urged me to uh, attempt to uh, illustrate, if not a children's picture book, then perhaps a book of poems. Uh, I, I, I am frankly intimidated by it. I, 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 have, I almost feel it's disrespectful to all the great illustrators out there to presume to do it myself. If you've seen my children's books, they're all just beautifully illustrated by among the best illustrators out there. And I just, uh, I'm just not nearly as good. It almost, uh, it almost feels like a vanity to illustrate my own work, but maybe I'll overcome that. God knows, <laughs> God knows I've, I've broken every rule I ever made for myself. I believe we have the youngest questionnaire in the history of a Clinton School program <laughs> right here. Will I ever come again? You know, I am almost certain that I will come again. Yeah. I, I've had such a good time here. All right. We have another one over here. No, we may have a new younger. How did you do the mouse story? How do I remember it? Well, you know, I, I wrote it myself. <laughs> so it's a little easier for me to remember it than anybody else. But you know, you can, you can learn almost anything if you really spend time on it and, and, and study it. The next acting job I'm going to do is a one-man show that I've devised for myself 
which lasts about 90 minutes long. And I talk for 90 minutes, and it's all up in my brain. And half of that nine mi 90 minutes is a short story that was written by a man named P.G. Woodhouse. Maybe someday you'll see that. All right, we've got time for one more question because we have a long line for books. Okay, right over here, final question. I just forgot. I, My brain beg, is not that good. I beg, I didn't, didn't quite get the question. I just forgot. He just forgot his question. Forgot oh, you forgot question. your question? That's well, okay. My brain is not that good. No, it's not. Well, maybe the next. Book. All right, we'll take one more since we had a where. Okay. All right, we got one right over here. We got, let's see, let's get a young, a young student. Do we have a young student that, or a young person that had a question? Well, no, I know, I was trying to give it to the kids. If we got, we had a, is there a young, is there any other youngster that has a question? What? Well, that, that'll do. <laughs> I just want to make sure that all the students have had a chance to ask their question. All right, you're close. I bet I, I knew it, I knew it. There's always somebody. <laughs> what did he say? He says that the, my introduction left out my greatest role ever, which was Dr. Emilio Lizardo in Buckaroo Bonsai, which tells you, which tells you something about how weird this young man is. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, let's give him a big hand as we go to sign the book.